Well, I, I posted, uh, we're starting a new series today uh, called Incredible Women. Incredible Women. I posted this week on Instagram just the question of, you know, who's, who's had maybe the most impactful, uh, who's, what, what lady has been the most impactful in your life? Uh, most of those responses were mom, mom or grandmother. Uh, Ellen was in that list, which uh, she had a great quote this week, if you did not read that or see that, I highly recommend you finding that quote about being kind to all people, no matter who they are, what they believe. So there's some impact that women have, and you probably have someone, if you think in your mind, someone who's been impactful in your life, and the question is why? Why why has that person been incredible to you? Why, Why have they been impactful in your life? Now, we know that throughout history uh, that women often have been seen as less than. It's been, it's been difficult, and we could say that that was history, that that was way, you know, a long time ago, but that's not really true. Uh, we still see that today, but even if you didn't know, 1920, women finally get to vote. Women finally have a voice. Um, in, in 1963, uh, finally someone came along and said that women shouldn't be paid differently than men for doing the same job. I'm not sure that that doesn't happen now. Um, but, but women have been overlooked and uh, seen differently than men often. And can I just tell you that that's not okay? I think, I think we should know that, uh, but it's, it's not okay. Uh, God has created men and women in his image. Uh, we are all bearers of the image of God. And honestly, some things that have happened have been really sinful towards women. And so we even look in the scriptures and we can see that. Uh, We look at the narrative, the biblical narrative, and it wasn't that different then. And actually, it was even worse in how women were seen or perceived or looked at. And so we're going to spend some time looking at some women in the Bible and how through their faith or actions have really impacted or changed history. We've seen this uh, in, in our own country, Amelia Earhart of her solo flight, Harriet Tubman who escaped slavery and helps others. Clara Barton, I don't know if you know that name. She was a nurse in the Civil War, and we have the Red Cross really because of of her. We have Susan B. Anthony who helped lead the fight for women's right to vote. These lives have impacted history, and the ones we're going to look at in the scriptures have as well. Today we're going to start with the story of Rahab. Uh, If you're new to the Bible, uh, maybe Rahab is not a story that you're familiar with, but it is one of my favorites. Um, It's a story that I haven't preached on or talked about, uh, but one that is going to be, I believe, really helpful to us today. Um, We're going to first start in Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to look at the genealogy of Jesus. And you may think that seems odd. Uh, If you've read the Bible, maybe when you get to the Gospels, which is the story of Jesus' life, Matthew, it lists a bunch of people. And I'm going to assume many of you have seen that, and you're like, chapter 2, right? You just kind of move past that. Uh, You can't always pronounce the names in that genealogy, uh, but it's important. How many of you have done any genetic testing? 23andMe, those kind of things. Uh, You you have kind of learned some history of your family. Sometimes people do that for health reasons, right? They want to find out what's in their lineage, what they need to pay attention to, what, what are some health concerns. Uh, Maybe it's trying to find out who you're related to. That's why I would want to do it. Uh, who am I related to? I've heard that I'm related to John Hancock, the John Hancock. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I've heard. Uh, maybe it's infamous people that you're related to, uh, people you would say, oh, I wish that didn't come up. I'd rather not know I was related to those people. There's a story right now of a husband and wife who did this and found out they were third cousins, uh, right? Right? And their kids pushed them to do it, and so they had to tell their kids, you know, this is your fault that now we, we know, right? Uh, but we see in the genealogy of Jesus a bunch of names, a bunch of people. But Rahab, this woman, finds herself in the genealogy of Jesus. I'm, I'm kind of going to jump around here. Uh, we see Matthew 1, verse 1, it says this. It says, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Who's in the family tree, basically, is what we're going to look at. The son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. 
Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Verse 5. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. And then in the end, verse 16, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So we have it starting with Abraham. If you don't know much about the Old Testament or the biblical narrative, that is a really big name. That is an important person in the history of our faith. And it ends with Jesus. And there in the middle is a woman named Rahab. Now, if you don't know the story, you may think, well, why is that significant? Now, let me read to you out of the Old Testament. It's Joshua 2. If you don't own a Bible, there's a red Bible around you somewhere. That's our gift to you. Please take that. We we want you to have that. Um, It's going to have a page number on the screen uh, for where it is in that Bible. It's uh, not real long, but it's about 20... 20 verses, and so you can read along, you can listen. Uh, There's some important things in this, and I don't want to leave anything else. So I'm going to start verse 1 in chapter 2. It says, Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Yeah, we'll go with that. Shittim. Go, yeah. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the women had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road, and that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you you when you came out of Egypt, and when you did in Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Now she had said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return and then go on your way. The men said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window which you will let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into the house, if anything, if anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head. We will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let us be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Okay, so I want to I do a couple things. I want to pull a couple things out of there. And then I want to ask us some difficult questions. Uh, things about Rahab in this story that I think we need to answer as well. But before we move on, I just quickly want to talk about who Rahab was. And the title that is given to her throughout the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. I don't believe that any girl then or now dreams of doing what she was doing. That was not the hopes of Rahab as a six-year-old, 
10-year-old, 12-year-old. I don't think that that was what she looked for in her, in her future. And I think that's still true today. I think those in that line of work, we, we often have an opinion or a thought about. But, but can I just possibly offer a different way of thinking? That it's probably things that have been done to them, to Rahab, that have caused her to find herself in the place that she's in. That it's the wickedness of a system, it's the wickedness of man, it is the wickedness of people that have put her in that place. Rahab probably finds herself abused and treated as an object, not a person, and for whatever reason, Rahab or others find themselves in this role. And it is really the sins against them, not necessarily their sins, that have most likely probably found themselves there. And she has been treated as a commodity to be used. This is who Rahab is. And so can you imagine women during this time were overlooked, um, not appreciated, they didn't have a voice, and so Rahab would have been seen even below that. So, So this is who Rahab is, and this is the life that she is living. A life of despair, a life of hopelessness, a a, a life of just probably existing. And so there would have been many men who have found themselves in her house. But, But this time it's different. People are normally demanding something of her, but again, this time the demands look different. She knew who these men were. She had an idea of where they had come from and why they were there. And she wanted to treat them kindly because of what God was doing. And so they come to this agreement that she's going to hide them, that she will not tell. And in response, the spies say that your life and the lives of your family will also be spared. And the instruction is, there's a a picture, just an image that, that, that has been created. This isn't the actual image um, from Tin, uh, but, but this is what it possibly would have been looked like, what it, what, it, what it would have looked like. That the spies say, tie this crimson thread or scarlet thread on the window, and this is the sign to us that we will pass over your house, that you will be spared, that you will not be taken out, you or your family. So we have the agreement, Joshua 6, 7 through 25. It says, The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in the house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so every man charged straight in and took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house, bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young man who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put out, put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and a whole belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho and she lives among the Israelites to this day. So there's some things we could talk about, war and what happens to that city, and, and, and I'm not going to dive into that too much. I don't always understand that. I'll just make that statement of how whole places are wiped out. There was a disobedience. They were rebelling against God, and so this was the response of the Israelites. Um, I don't always understand that, but what I do see is some things happen in Rahab's life. Rahab has no hope at all. I don't know if you've ever been at that place where you, you feel like your future is completely hopeless. This is her. But then something happens, and she sees these spies come into her home. She knows something is happening, and all of a sudden there is this glimmer of hope. And so the first thing I want to point out about Rahab is Rahab, as they say in the story, the prostitute, 
has this tremendous faith, a tremendous faith. Rahab says, I've heard what's been happening. I've heard the faithfulness of God. I've heard how he rescued you and saved you. And I believe that the Lord your God, this is what she says, is the God in heaven above and on the earth below. This is a statement of faith by Rahab. Rahab, in the face of what has happened to her and what is going on currently, hears about what has done and knowing the facts, what has taken place, what God has done, believes in God. She knew it, she believed it, and she put her hope in it. And it is in this faith that she makes the request that she makes. She believes that life could actually look different. Like, I just wonder in this conversation with the spies, I, I have this picture of Rahab always being broken and beat down. Someone who, who is downcast and doesn't look at anyone in the eye. But I have this image of Rahab looking at the spies in the eyes and saying, I think something can happen in my future. I've heard what God has been doing. I heard what God is doing, and I think God could rescue me. I think God could do something in my life. See, she believes that a rescue is possible. A, a rescue from what is about to take place in Jericho, that maybe she doesn't have to suffer the same thing that's happening to the rest of Jericho, but also that a rescue could happen in her life and that no longer could she carry the title prostitute. That maybe her life could look different, different that the impossible could be made possible. That is the kind of faith that Rahab has. Again, her situation is hopeless. Her life has been hopeless, but somehow in the midst of that hopelessness, she hears about God and she has hope. And she puts her faith in that. She had faith. And I think she has small faith, but great faith. The small faith that just says, if I could just help the spies, if I could just help them get out of Jericho, then God is going to do something on my behalf. There's a, a book in the Bible called Hebrews, and in Hebrews 11, it lists uh, this, this section of all these people of great faith. Um, it, it talks about Noah, if you've ever heard of Noah, it talks about Noah and Moses and Abraham and Sarah and Joseph, and it talks about the Israelites literally seeing the Red Sea part and having this faith that they're going to get through to the other side. This is a list, uh, a, a who's who of faith. And then in the end of it, Hebrews 11, 30, 31, the author says this, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell, and after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Rahab is listed. She is listed in the lineage of the life of Jesus, right? And that's why it's significant. The, the life of Rahab, the prostitute, is in the family tree of Jesus. That is significant. You know, I, I can imagine at some point someone says, are we sure we want to leave Rahab in the family tree? You might have relatives who maybe things haven't gone well, and maybe you, you have those situations. You're like, man, they have rebelled, and I don't know what they're doing. There are there are people who probably thought, I don't know if we should leave it. But Rahab is in the family tree of Jesus. But she's not only listed in the lineage of Jesus, but she's also listed in this line of people who have this unbelievable faith. Because Rahab, as simple-minded as she can, she doesn't know a lot, but she has heard of what Jesus, God is doing, the Lord is doing. She puts her faith in that. And see, we tell the stories of everyone else. Like we tell those stories to our kids. There are songs about those other people. I'm not sure anyone's going to bed at night with their kids and telling the story of Rahab. Right? We, we tell the story about the faithfulness of, Ahab, of Abraham. But there's no like, all right, Johnny, this is what we're looking at tonight. Uh, we're looking at the faithfulness of the prostitute Rahab. But she has made her way into this story. Because it has taken this small faith, but... Great faith. And the second thing, Rahab doesn't just have faith, but she has a courageous faith. Rahab knows what could happen to her for what she's doing with the spies. 
She knows she's putting her life on the line. She will die. She will be killed if she is caught hiding these spies. She was making a tremendous sacrifice, but it was worth it. And it's in this moment that Rahab doesn't just have faith, but she has this courageous faith. And I think that it was in this potential to fear what could happen to her and to her family, there was also an opportunity to trust that God would get her through it. Let me just say this again. Where there's moments of fear in your life, it's the uncertainty to what's next, it's test results you're waiting on, it's difficulty in relationships, and there's this fear of what could happen, that maybe is also an opportunity for trust. For a belief that in the midst of fear that we can trust that God will see us through. And I think that's what Rahab is doing. She knows what could happen, but she is also believing that God will get her out. So I don't know where you're at in that. If there's a fear that has creeped in, if there's an opportunity where you could actually trust God more. But she has this courageous faith. And Rahab is willing to give her life for it. It's just not a part of her life, but it now is who she is. And so I think, just, just quickly, I, I think that is the call on our life as well. That the faith we have is a faith that says, all right, God, I'm giving you my entire life. This is what Rahab does in this moment. Rahab knows what her outcome could be, but she entirely gives herself over to the Lord. She gives her life, and we are called to do the same. Third thing, it's not just faith or a courageous faith, but a faith that leads to action. Her faith in what God had done did not stay in her heart or in her mind. If Rahab is unwilling to risk her life for the spies, her faith would have been useless. If she says, I've heard what God has done. I believe that he could do something for me, but I just am not sure I can do this for you, spies. Then the faith that she has is really meaningless. It's useless. It doesn't matter. But because of this faith, it leads her to action. The result of the proof of Rahab's faith was works. Again, the, the name of Rahab or the life of Rahab really had been imprinted on the Israelites, but also makes its way into the New Testament. James, the half-brother of Jesus, as talking about what is the result of our faith, James 2.25 says this, In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? James is saying, look, there was a response to the faith that Rahab had. There's this faith and works, that our faith works itself out into our lives. The proof of Rahab, the prostitute's faith, was action. I was in uh, Rolla yesterday. We ran down to some friends who moved down to Rolla, so we ran down there for a, a fall festival. We were on our way back, and, and my wife, we have season tickets to Six Flags, and so I'm, We've talked about going to Fright Fest. We've never been. And so Heather was like, you know, jokingly, not jokingly, hey, should we stop by Fright Fest? And at first, both my kids were like, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. And so we're, we're in the car kind of thinking we might stop in. And, and then my, I, I noticed that Cade, my nine-year-old, kept asking, like, how close are we to Six Flags? Are we almost to Six Flags? And, and so we started having this conversation because Cade had been really brave like two hours before we started approaching to, to Six Flags, right? She, she st he started asking, are we, are we almost there? And so I just kind of said, do, we don't really have to go. I mean, like, it was just a conversation. Do you, do you really want to go? And he's like, I, th I think I want to go. I don't know if I want to go. And I was like, look, it's going to be scary. I'm going to be scared. So if we don't go, I'm okay with that. And, and so we're, we're, talking, we're talking through this. And Kate's kind of quiet in the back. And then he's like, yeah, I, I saw the commercial and kind of got scared by the commercial. And I was like, bud, if the commercial scares you, you are going to be really scared at Six Flags, right? And here's what finally happened. Cade said, I don't want to go. What he believed finally worked itself out in how he was going to behave. Do you see that? 
for a lot of us, we say we believe certain things about God. We believe certain things about God wants for us, but it doesn't always work itself out in our lives. It doesn't always connect. And so super, super quick, I'm going to run through some things for you just to kind of think about in your own life. Rahab was not in the ideal circumstances for her to come to faith. Where she finds herself in life may not have been the ideal place for her to find faith as an outsider. Right? She's, in a, citizen, uh, she's a citizen of a wicked city. She's part of a, a corrupt and deprived and pagan culture. It's a life of being abused and used. And you may see your story and think, man, how could I ever come to faith? How could God ever give me hope? But honestly, I think Rahab is in a perfect place to put her faith in God. She has nothing else. And so where are you? You may think there's no way that that could be my story. That where I am now is where I'm always going to be. And so why put my faith in anything? But maybe you are in the right place right now to put your faith in God. Grace, number two, grace, forgiveness, salvation is available to all. The grace of God is available to everyone. Nobody is outside the opportunity of God's grace and forgiveness. Nobody. Nobody. Uh, That's part of the theme of this story, is that Rahab, who many of us would say is an outsider, we have that list now of people who we would see as outsiders, the grace and forgiveness and love of God is for them. There, there's a quote, and I can't think, Carlo, a guy named Carlos says, whenever we draw a line and we create insiders and outsiders, Jesus will always move across the line to the outsiders. And so grace, forgiveness, love is available to everyone. Three, nobody is unable to be used by God. Nobody. God's purpose to our lives is not limited by your past, what you've done, or in Rahab's story, what's been done to her. Everyone can be used by God to make a difference. Your life matters. You're not an accident. Your life isn't ruined because of some of the decisions maybe you have made. Rahab the prostitute, is a woman of great faith in the midst of her circumstances, and she is used by God and is rescued by him. And then the result of our faith or our belief is works. There was proof that Rahab believed. So we say we love God and we love people, and the reason we say that is because we cannot say we love God if we don't love people. We cannot believe that God loves us if we are unwilling to love others. We cannot say we are putting our faith in God and then go against his will for our lives. We cannot say that we are followers of Jesus and know what he wants us to do and then not do it. Right? There is a connection to what we say we believe and then what we do. What you believe will always impact or should always impact how you behave. And then the final thing. Rahab was worth saving. When she had been overlooked, when people thought certain things about her, the people knew who she was. There was no surprise. No one went into that house after the spies had gotten there and thought, whoa, what does Rahab do? Rahab was known. Rahab was known by God. But Rahab was worth saving, and so are you. John 3, 16, for God so loved The world, you are included in that. That he gives Jesus to rescue us, to redeem us, to save us. And if you have not caught the the image of the scarlet thread, the crimson cord, there is a direct connection between that saving Rahab and Jesus dying on a cross. Right? There is this scarlet thread that runs throughout the Old Testament that is pointing to Jesus. This story of Rahab was pointing to the one who would come, who would die on a cross, whose blood would be shed for us. So the crimson cord that saved Rahab now is Jesus' life, death, 
resurrection that rescues us. And it is available to all of us. And so you have to figure out in your life and and Rahab's life what she stood for, the faith that she had, and what that meant to so many people then and now. Her life mattered then. Her life mattered in Jesus' days. Her life mattered after Jesus. We see it in the writings, and it matters to us now. Rahab, the prostitute, is a great example of faith and even a bigger picture and greater picture of who God is. Greg's going to come up and sing our final song, and as he's moving, I just want to encourage you this morning. If you are in a place right now where you have never put your faith in God, you've figuratively never hung the crimson cord out believing that there is one who could rescue you, today is a great day to do that. Today is a great day to believe that there is grace and forgiveness for your life. And you can do that just in conversation with God, admitting that you need him, that you believe and you want to put your faith in him, and then just asking to give you hope and to rescue you. But a lot of you have done that. So the question for you is, how is that working itself out in your life? What is the proof of your faith? We see what it is in the life of Rahab. What is it for us? Would you stand as I pray and we sing this final song together? God, thank you for Rahab. I thank you you that you are a God who sees us, who knows us, everything about us, and you love us fully. There is nothing that has happened to us or in us or things that we have done that have eliminated us from your grace and your love or the purpose that you can give us in our lives. So God, I pray for my friends here today who maybe for the first time would put their faith in you. God, I pray for my friends here today that are trying to figure out what it looks like to live this out. What does it look like to have a courageous faith? What does it look like for our works to put on display what we believe? God, would you help us to do that? We thank you once again that Rahab was worth saving, and so are we. Thank you for that great love.